Celebrating 43 years on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, a new trade deal with Japan likely to boost the economy. Josh Maples weighs in on the ag effect. Plus, before we meet this year's logging king, one last chance to meet the outgoing logger of the year. In Southern Gardening, up for a little late season color, Gary's got flowers with summer grit and fall flares. And in our feature, as promised, the 2019 logger of the year. For him, performance literally the name of the game. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. By now you have probably heard about that new trade deal with Japan. Unlike the commodity and intellectual property issues that remain deadlocked in talks with the Chinese, the New Deal gives greater access to American producers. In the meantime, as talks with the Chinese are set to resume, those American producers are breathing at least a small sigh of relief. Peter Tubbs reports. A trade deal with Japan promises lower tariffs on both sides of the Pacific. Under this agreement, we together will be able to bring benefits to everyone in Japan, as well as in the United States, namely consumers, producers, and workers. So the outcome of this negotiation is actually a win-win solution for Japan and the United States. The agreement gives the U.S. enhanced market access to its third largest trading partner. The deal reduces or eliminates tariffs on 7.2 billion in agricultural products, almost half of the 14 billion imported by the Japanese annually. Over 5 billion worth of imports were already duty-free. Tariffs on beef and pork will be reduced in stages, but the exact timeline has yet to be announced. Other agricultural products will see their tariffs reduced immediately. Wheat will still face a quota limit on the amount that can be exported to the island nation. The deal also reduces import taxes on software and digital media that is traded between the two countries. The U.S. exports roughly twice the value of pork to Japan than to China and is the second largest destination for pork products after Mexico. The National Pork Producers Council expects 2% growth in sales to Japan per year over the next 15 years. Other trade categories, most notably the import and export of cars, will be discussed during the next stage of negotiations. According to the U.S. Meat Export Federation, with Japan being the largest value destination for U.S. pork and beef exports, there is no market more critical to the profitability and prosperity of the U.S. red meat industry. It is therefore imperative that we achieve a level playing field for U.S. pork and beef in Japan so that the U.S. industry can further expand its customer base in this increasingly competitive market. The National Pork Producers Council says, We've seen market share declines in Japan, historically our largest value export market, since the start of the year when international competitors gained more favorable access through new trade agreements. Once implemented, the agreement signed today puts U.S. pork back on a level playing field with our competitors in Japan. The deal with Japan spurred hope for progress on USMCA. The NAFTA replacement has been stalled in the House over democratic concerns about labor standards, enforceability, and pharmaceutical costs. We just received word earlier this week that uh, Lighthizer is going to continue his negotiations with a small group of House Democrats to work out differences on uh, environment, labor, and enforcement. Late in the week, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi assured lawmakers that work on USMCA will move ahead. In our Southern Gardening segment today, as we usually do this time of year, we're talking about color. For those of you straining to wring out every bit of color you can as we head into a cooler part of the year, this story's for you. Here's Dr. Gary Bachman with the details, and we don't call him Doc for nothing. Today's Southern Gardening is at the North Mississippi Research and Extension Center in Verona, taking a look at a planting that has really stood up to the heat of our summer. 
One of my first favorite flowers for the landscape were the narrow leaf, also called threadleaf zinnia, known botanically as zinnia angustifolia. These are the forebearers of the newer profusion and Zahara zinnias. I think the compact and mounding growth habit is perfect for any landscape combination planting. These plants' white and orange flowers are produced in profuse numbers and brighten the garden. Purslanes are low-growing, spreading, flowering annual plants. Some of the better flowering purslanes, and there are many to choose from, include the colors rose, scarlet, orange, and yellow. The plants have a tropical look and put on a show with flowers up to one inch wide. The flowers will also close in the afternoon or on cloudy days. The bright yellow stamens are fairly long and will move with the gentlest touch, adding more interest. The stems are purplish green and the leaves are bright green. They will grow up to eight inches tall and spread up to 18 inches. These were spaced about 12 to 15 inches apart when planted in the spring. Other plants that look good mixed throughout the planting bed include this nice dark scarlet petunia, purple angelonia, and white finca. Choosing the right flowering summer annuals will pay off all the way through the fall season. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. As you may know, there are more than two billion acres of land in the United States. Roughly a third of it is forest land. The people who harvest all that timber are known as loggers. Later in the show, you'll meet this year's logger of the year. But first, one last chance to meet the outgoing logging king. He's the 2018 logger of the year, Drew Massey. Timber, as far as the eye can see. For hundreds of years, Americans skilled in both harvesting and preserving our great forests have made logging their careers. In the process, providing homes, churches, schools, and every other wood-related product upon which we now depend. It's the kind of work that gets in your blood. The kind of work done every day by Mississippi's Logger of the Year, Drew Massey. Massey Timber is a young company, just six years old, young like its owner just 31. It's just a, a way of life I guess. I, I really love being around nature and just being in the woods and um, the equipment. I, I, I love the equipment and um, something I've always had a passion for and just um, I, I just it's something I've loved to do my entire life and it's really all I've ever wanted to do just um, just being in the woods. Drew's dad owned a logging company. As a small child Drew heaped dirt chunks for fun on job sites. His dad sold the company in 2010. Two years later, Drew, a born logger with his bachelor's and master's from Mississippi State, opened the company that would become his lifeblood and that of his crew members. Drew finds it hard to answer the question, how did you get so far in such a short time? I really have no idea. Um, I just, um, I'm very honored to have this, um, this honor so, so early in my career. Um, I, I never dreamed I, I would have uh, been chosen for this award. Um, but I just will come out here every day and try to do uh, the best job we possibly can and um, try to portray for the public a good image of, of logging and uh, just uh, do what we love to do. That's amazing. That means he must be doing something right and handling stuff right. Roderick Miller is Drew's foreman. The two share everything about the company. He says he has complete faith in his boss, but that didn't stop him from smiling when the announcement was made. It was shocking, man. I ain't gonna tell you no tale. I read about other people, but never thought it'd be us. You know, it, it was a big, happy moment, you know. The guy's happy with it, I'm happy with it, and he showed sure up happy with it. He was butterflied up when he found out, I don't know if I'll get it, I don't know if I'll get it. I said, Drew, you're competing against the big ones, but that don't mean they always win. I said, a small one could shine at some time. Virtually everything Massey Timber cuts these days is for Weyerhaeuser, one of the largest companies of its kind in the world. Jason Adams has been working with Drew for a year and a half. He says Drew was young, but he's solid. Young. He's a little young for the logger. Most of the logging crowd's a little bit older, but uh, he's he's smart and he's, he knows the business part of it really good, so it's, that's an asset to him. He can clear cut, thin, whatever we need. If we got a meal that we're running low on, he can, he can jump to a clear cut and he can do thin and he's just real versatile. With the logging industry the way it is, you have stuff that just changes at the last minute and we could have him plan to go do one thing and at the last minute, you know, talk to him and 
you know, he'll go do something else for us, you know. And, and like I said, you know, with when you have somebody that can thin or clear cut, it's just a big asset. You know, luckily he's second generation, and so he's had experience most of his life and through his father. And so it, it's, it's just tremendous that he was able to, to get this company up and running at that young age. I mean, it's, it, it's a fantastic fantastic example of the young loggers we have in the state of Mississippi. There are roughly a thousand loggers in Mississippi, so it takes a lot to emerge at the top of the heap. And of course, the work itself is a blend of technique, technology, and a commitment to operating efficiently and productively. Work ethic is everything. Well, out here, it's very, it's very physically demanding. Um, not so much as it used to be years ago because the technology and the machines have increased, but just the sheer amount of hours and the, the um, technique that's involved with this um, harvesting equipment today, you, you, uh, you really have to know what you're doing out here in order to operate in a productive and safe manner. Um, it's, uh, it's very imperative that somebody's at uh, optimal, optimal productivity at all times. Of course, safety is no minor issue with all of this heavy equipment. This crop of tall, heavy, unwieldy trees and the need to harvest as many of them as possible. Safety has to come first. Safety is such an important factor out here. It's, it's the top priority for us. Um, every, if I tell the guys all the time, if, uh, if, if we're safe, everything else will, will fall into place after that. Um, it's just all this, the large equipment and the harvesting of trees, it's one of the most dangerous, dangerous industries uh, that you can be in. And um, I, I just want the guys to be as safe as possible and go home the same way they came to the job. Drew's done a fantastic job on his time. If you walk to his job site, you can always see that he's got things put together in such a manner that it's easy to tell that safety is his number one priority. Uh, the quality of his work and how he treats uh, the land for whichever landowner he happens to be working for, it's just impeccable. And so we really think he's an outstanding uh, candidate uh, for this Logger of the Year. Those who nominated Drew for the honor of Logger of the Year say he shows a proactive approach to every aspect of his operation. From job site planning to production to safety, erosion control, equipment maintenance, and beyond. Ultimately, it's a huge responsibility. Forestry is important to all of us. It's important to our everyday life, just not only because of the fact that we are living in a land that is covered in forest, but also all the products that come from that for building, construction, homes, schools, churches, etc. And the logger is at the core of delivering that product to the mill that then processes it into lumber, furniture, etc. So the responsibility a logger has in tending to the forest, natural, nature's creation is so, so and very, very important. Good at best practices, pays attention to detail, proactive, committed to planning. These are all ways that the 2018 Logger of the Year, Drew Massey, has been described by those who work for and with him. At the end of the day, though, one of Drew's drivers seems to sum it up best, and quite simply at that. He deserves it. He worked hard for a young man. You know, he, 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 he worked hard for it. You know, he got us working hard for it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he deserves it. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up in our Farm Week feature, we'll announce the 2019 Logger of the Year. He's just 39 years old, but he's achieved a lot in his short career. Believe it or not, he actually got his start when he was about five years old. Well, kind of anyway. Like a lot of people in the business, he's got logging in his blood. He's a third generation logger. Still, he's got a standout way of running his logging company and a lot of people behind him. That's coming up. Don't go away. Healthy living, healthy gardening. That's the focus of the 2019 Fall Flower and Garden Fest in Crystal Springs. This annual festival features the latest flower, fruit, and vegetable varieties, expert advice on home gardening and landscaping, as well as guided tours throughout the beautiful demonstration gardens. Be sure to attend the Fall Flower and Garden Fest October 11th and 12th at the MSU Truck Crops Experiment Station in Crystal Springs. Scenic white sandy shores are the jewel of Mississippi's Gulf Coast. But to keep them looking beautiful, we need your help. 
Each year, volunteers with the Mississippi Coastal Cleanup remove thousands of pounds of trash and marine debris from the state's shorelines, barrier islands, and coastal waterways. And it's time to do it again on Saturday, October 19th. So do your part and lend a helping hand. Go to mscoastalcleanup.org to volunteer. Before we get back to the show, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. Just one item and you just heard all about it from 9 to 2 on Friday and Saturday, October 11th and 12th at the Truck Crop Branch Experiment Station in Crystal Springs, the Fall Flower and Garden Fest. This two-day event is the largest home gardening show in the southeast with average attendance of about 5,000 people. The event is free and there will be plenty of food on hand. For more information, call 601-892-3731. Now, check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. Earlier, we got a big picture look at the new U.S.-Japan trade deal, which many think couldn't have come at a better time. Ag-wise, most of the beef that leaves the U.S. ends up there, but now the cost of getting it there will be a lot less. It's a victory for beef producers who are cheering the deal, and I sat down with economist Josh Maples to find out why. So Josh, this new U.S.-Japan trade agreement looks like it could be a pretty big deal for a lot of ag groups, including beef producers. Why is that? Yeah, that's exactly right, Mike. And as you mentioned, this trade deal is much bigger than just beef, but this is the trade deal that beef producers have been really looking forward to. Uh, Beef is our biggest market. That's where we send most of the beef that leaves the U.S., ends up in Japan. It's not just a quantity thing, it's also a value. That's a huge value market for U.S. beef. It's been our top value destination uh, for many years. But the key there is that while we've been sending a lot of beef to Japan already, uh, we've been doing it at pretty high tariff rates. You know, So 38.5% tariff on beef going into Japan uh, that's much higher than a lot of our competitors. So Australia is the main one that gets uh, discussed mostly. So, you know, we're sending a lot of beef to Japan, but, you know, we're, it's costing more to import our beef than it is uh, other, other folks' beef. So this is a big win for us because we've already got the market there. We already know that we can trade with them. Uh, but also now we're going to be able to do it at much more competitive rates. So it's going to be a more level playing field. Uh, and this is just great news for the beef industry and, and, and the kind of trade deal that we've been looking forward to. So it's something that, uh, that producers really have been anticipating, haven't they? Absolutely. And so if you think back, this, you know, the beef specific thing, this was the, the, um, uh, the jewel for TPP for beef producers. You know, if you think back to TPP a few years ago, right. beef producers liked that because it was going to do basically what this deal is going to do for beef producers uh, between us and Japan. So that was why a lot of beef producers were not happy to see TPP go away. Uh, so now, a couple of years later, we're getting back to where we're going to get uh, the same kind of assurances or the same tariff rates uh, that we would have gotten in TPP a couple of years ago. So we'll look forward to this unfolding, including a lot of the details to come. Exactly right. And finally, we come to the big announcement, the 2019 Logger of the Year. It is no easy job owning a logging company. A lot of factors, weather, prices, labor shortages, equipment costs, and the sheer physicality of it, conspire against those who would make it their profession. Still, some of them stand out. And with all that in mind, meet a man who's apparently living out his calling in a work environment most people will never see. According to the USDA, three quarters of a billion acres of U.S. land is forested, generating more than $280 billion in products. In Mississippi, nearly 20 million acres of land is covered with trees owned by 125,000 different landowners. Needless to say, there's a lot riding on the logging industry. So when you're named the logger of the year, it's an impressive achievement. Say hello to the Mississippi Logger of the Year, 39-year-old Drew Sullivan. It's a great honor, you know. I mean, I, I know people have logged all their lives, you know, and, and didn't get any recognition at all. And, and for me to have that at such a young age, I mean, it, it's meant a lot to me, and, uh, and it, it's been an honor. Sullivan started his company, Performance Logging, eight years ago. But his love of the great outdoors and forestry in particular came long before that. 
His grandfather was a logger, so was his father Gary, who ran SNS Thinning, featured in Southern Logging Times back in 96. It's easy to see how Drew's love of logging could be kindled. As a kid, I'd play. I, my dad and my grandparents would buy me little toys and trucks and little skitters and stuff from B&G and some of the local dealerships. They would have little toy skitters and stuff. And, and I'd log, man. When I was, you know, five and six years old, I'd be out there logging. You know, I'd had a, a little handsaw and I would cut little saplings down and cut them up in sticks and haul them. And uh, so that's all I've ever wanted to do, I guess. I've been knowing Drew since he was about 10 years old. Jack Harrison is president of the Neshoba County Forestry Association. He's a consulting forester and member of the committee that nominated Drew for the honor. Knowing him as a young boy, you could tell then that he had a he had a longing to be in the woods and and he had logging as an idea for his profession and since he has become a professional logger and we have we have observed his work and his work ethics and uh, his concern for the environment and his safety of his employees and the public that he works around. We just knew that he would be a good candidate for our selection for the Outstanding Logger of the Year. Performance logging cuts for Weyerhaeuser, one of the biggest companies of its kind in the world. Chuck Burke is an area manager for the uh, Drew, company. Drew is very much aligned with what Weyerhaeuser's um, core, po core business policies are. I mean, he, he's really good at safety and that, that he stands out uh, really from the standpoint of he sets himself apart from other loggers. Uh, by the way he handles his, uh, his business safety-wise. He's got some really good processes in place that he has done on his own. And uh, that, that really makes him uh, pretty, pretty valuable to the company. Safety, a key operational component for every logger. Vince Cusimano, a procurement forester and member of the Logger of the Year Committee, makes that abundantly clear. Something goes wrong out here, somebody usually dies. Uh, something really bad can happen really quick out here. This equipment, these trees, they don't forgive. Uh, you can get hurt quick. And it's a difficult uh, job that they have to do every day. And uh, they're, like I said, challenges every day, things change, um, and he's able to work with those and adapt very well. I told all the truck drivers, and I tell you guys too on the way out. To, to keep safety high on the priority list, Drew holds weekly and daily tailgate safety briefings. He and his crews discuss every aspect of the job and work site, making sure key details stick with everybody. He also practices radar, a unique strategy of recognizing hazards and developing a plan and to address them. To Drew, it's vital. Performance logging has never had a lost time accident, and it's personal. Safety is a big deal to me because I have two little small kids. Most of all my guys, they have family, and, and everybody wants to come home safe in the afternoon. There's no load of wood worth risking your life over. Um, logging has, has, has a bad rep for being a, a real dangerous job. It's getting a lot better. We don't even have a power saw on this, on this job anymore. We, we trim up with a pole saw. All of our personal protection equipment's worn, um, so safety's a big deal, um, and I, I push that, and all my guys know that. So um, I'm, I'm proud to be, you know, real safety conscientious. Beyond safety, stewardship is, of course, just as important. Taking care of the land, water, and trees, and employees and the equipment they use, Drew says, is the mark of a good logger. Being logger of the year is a is a big is a big deal to me. I mean that that means a lot. I mean that's a great accomplishment, and um, and loggers in the past have had bad reps. Years past, you know, rutting and not taking care of the land like they're supposed to. And and not, logging's come a long ways in the last 15, 20 years. Uh, a logger, a good logger, is uh, they're out there now and and they're taking care of the land like it's supposed to be. So I'm proud to be one of those guys. And so the tradition carries on. Drew's dad sold SNS years ago and now works for his son. And though he's a man of few words, he did have some to share when it comes to Drew. It's obvious he's proud. He's a 60, 70 year old man in a 39 year old body. That's what he, that's about what he amounts to. You know, he, like a rainy day, you got to be working on equipment or something like he does. And you can't just go lay around at the house, you know. And just like his dad, Drew's been featured in Southern Logging Times, too. He was on the cover in April of 2017, as much for his business savvy as his work ethic. Drew's a good fella. Um, 
good person. He deserves this. Uh, he's one of the ones that are going to be doing it for a long time. He's not going to be giving up. Uh, he's got a good business head on him and knows what he needs to do to make things work. He's got a good crew, uh, and he's really in the safety. So wanting everybody to get home at the end of the day. The weather factors, the transportation factors, meal quota factors, there's, there's just so many variables that go in that affect a logger that he has or has not much control over. And if you explain that to a young person that was looking for a career, they would probably turn down logging. But not Drew Sullivan, Mississippi's logger of the year. As grueling as the industry can be, he says he's in it for the long haul. After all, there's a reason his company is called Performance Logging. It's in my blood. It's been in my blood since I was a kid. I know that sounds funny to say that, but it really is. I, if I could do it all over again, if I had to start over, over again tomorrow, I'd start a logging crew up. That's what I would do. There's no question Drew Sullivan is a happy man when he's on the job. Congratulations to him. Well, next week we move on to the people who grow the trees that loggers cut, tree farmers. And we'll meet this year's Tree Farmer of the Year. But first, who sat in that chair before? Nearly a million and a half truckloads of lumber came out of Mississippi forests last year. Next time, a man who helped make all that possible. He's the outgoing Tree Farmer of the Year, as passionate about tree farming as he is history. And we'll announce this year's winner, too. That's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.